thanks for the honor of having me on this uh, series in this strange time. I'm broadcasting from my mother's house, so this is an unusual place to be doing this lecture from. I hope my mum doesn't come in while we're lecturing, but um, anyway, it's very nice of you to do this uh, for me. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about uh, the, well, I'll give you my brief, my brief research history, and then I'll talk about uh, the progress we've made in Parkinson's disease in Caucasian populations, in European populations, finding firstly both dominant and recessive genes, and then uh, through the leadership really of the IPDGC, finding uh, GWAS hits, that's hits uh, across the genome which have small influences on risk of disease. And then at the end, I'll talk about why it's really important we now, we now also study the genetics of Parkinson's disease in African populations. So I'm now going to share my screen. It'll just be a bit fiddly for a second while I do that. So this yep. is the title of my talk and uh, I'll just move you to one side and there we go. Uh, and uh, I'll just talk about where we're where we are uh, up to. So I started. I when I was a student, I always wanted to study neurological diseases, and um, so I started by doing neurochemistry and neuropathology as a uh, as a P well actually as an undergraduate, and then as a PhD student. So I started by looking at the changes in the brains of people who died of Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. So I, I started by studying those diseases. Of course, in Alzheimer's disease, that type of approach had ident led to the uh, identification of the cholinergic deficit in Alzheimer's disease and then indirectly uh, to cholinergic therapies for Alzheimer's, uh, for Alzheimer's disease. And this obviously was very influential. But what I realized uh, was that as we were studying the neurochemistry of the disease, of course, we were studying post-mortem brain tissue. So what we were doing is studying the end stage of the disease. We were studying the end of the disease. And uh, as we started, I thought that would be all that we could do. But then in 1983, this extremely influential paper came out from Jim Gusella's group in Boston using the newly developed technologies of, well, DNA, of DNA uh, restriction fragment length polymorphism uh, analysis in pedigrees with disease. And this paper excited me as a postdoc, and I'm sure it excited a generation of scientists the same age as me, the, the, you know, a whole cohort of individuals because what I realized looking at this paper was that this is a way to find out how the disease how diseases how genetic diseases start we obviously had got through pathology and neurochemistry and a good idea of how they ended but this I thought would give us a good idea as how they of how they started and by putting these two things together, how a disease starts and how it ends, we should be able, hopefully, to draw a line between the two, a metabolic line between the start and the finish, and then understanding that biochemical pathway, we might be able to prevent the disease. So when this paper came out, it had a huge influence on me, and I was very fortunate to be able to join a department who were applying molecular genetics. In fact, they were studying, the department I was studying was studying mainly cystic fibrosis, uh, and to try and understand the, the genetics of the disease. I have to say that when this paper came out, we thought it would be rather easy to find the genes from this paper, but in fact, in, in this study of Huntington's disease, it took 10 years to go from knowing where the gene was on the chromosome to finding the gene. 
that was because the, the human genome had not been sequenced uh, and we didn't have markers across the genome uh, and so on. And so PCR hadn't been invented and, and certainly DNA chips had not been invented. And so the, the techniques we were using were much more labor intensive then. Nowadays, to go from linkage to gene in a good family with disease is probably three, three months to six months uh, work in a good, in a well set up lab. So the promise of genetics in 1983 was that we could do this. The real, the, the real is, the realistic truth was that this only became easy to do, easy to do, I would say, from about 2010 to 2015. Now the first kindred I worked on in Parkinson's disease. I worked on this with uh, Andy Singleton uh, and this kindred uh, had been collected at the Mayo Clinic where I worked at the time and this, the, this part of the kindred here, this part of the kindred here who I got to know in the 1990s had been coming to the Mayo Clinic for their clinical care since this person came in about 1920. So you can see four generations of individuals had come uh, to the Mayo Clinic and many of the blood samples, the blood samples of all these individuals have been taken at the Mayo Clinic. But remarkably, this individual here who my arrow is on was still alive then. And he'd seen his two siblings die of the disease in their 40s, but he was by now 80. And he had carried out genealogy and realized this, this other family, which had moved to California, was part of the same family. And the joining up of the two families allowed us to draw this large pedigree in which we could identify the underlying mutation. Now, Bob Nussbaum, at, at, well, then at NIH, now at UCSF, had identified the synuclein gene a few years before, uh, and we collected this family and did linkage analysis. So we looked to see which areas of the genome all the uh, affected individuals shared, and we found they shared the synuclein locus. And when we did analysis, we saw something very surprising at the time. And you can see it most clearly on this chromosome spread here. Here is a cro the normal chromosome 4, and it's labeled, here is the synuclein locus here on chromosome 4. You can see there's one copy of the synuclein gene. But here on the other chromosome 4, the chromosome 4, which has been affected, uh, 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 inherited from the affected parent, there are in fact three copies of the chromosome, uh, of the gene. So in fact, this person who has got early onset Parkinson's disease, and I'll show you a video of this uh, person in a minute, this person has got four copies of the synuclein gene instead of the two copies the rest of us have got. And that has a simple consequence, and that is these people make twice people with this mutation make twice as much synuclein as their unaffected brothers and sisters now when you look at the pathology of parkinson's disease and this is um, taken by tamarin lashley at queen square and you can see this is lit up with the synuclein antibody and what you can see is that lewy bodies the pathology of synuclein uh, light up uh, Lewy bodies. So what we're seeing here is that overproduction of the protein is what causes the disease in this family and the deposits therefore are a consequence of this overproduction. The presence of synuclein in Parkinson's disease uh, Lewy bodies was first shown in fact by Maria Spilantini. So this all fits together very well. I'm now going to just drop out of the a slideshow for a second and show you, I hope. Hmm. 
maybe not. Sorry, I've seemed to have pulled up a different version of the slide set than I had thought. But I was going to show you the pathology, the the uh, clinical features of this woman. This I'll just explain the clinical features. Although she has she has Parkinson's disease, it's this it was this woman here in the pedigree. She has Parkinson's disease with an age of onset of about 35. Um, her first symptom had been as she was queuing to catch a plane when she was in her mid 20s, she noticed a tremor, which is what she'd seen in her father. And it took her 50, the, the disease in her lasted 15 years before it finally killed her just at the age of over 40. I'll just say something about L-DOPA therapy for a second in this family. And that is that these individuals all died before L-DOPA therapy. And in these individuals, uh, the disease onset to death was something like seven years. On average, it was seven years before L-DOPA. But these individuals all had the benefit of L-DOPA therapy, uh, and they, uh, on average, survived fift over 15 years before they die of the disease. So it just shows you how, although L-DOPA is just thought of as a treatment therapy, as, a, as if you like a, a therapy to deal with the symptoms rather than develop, dealing with the underlying pathogenesis, uh, still it, it allows the individuals to, to last 10 more years. And the first 10 of those years are very good years. So, you know, I think that we should, not, we should be really respectful, of course, of L-DOPA therapy. Now, Bob Nussbaum finding synuclein was the first gene. Here it is, synuclein. It's autosomal dominant, and the pathology is Lewy body pathology. The next gene that was found uh, was a recessive gene found by M Mitsuno in Japan, and that is, um, that is Parkin, the gene Parkin, which I'm going to talk about for a few seconds in a minute. The next gene after that that was found is pink one, also autosomal recessive, and that, has, uh, and that was found by my colleague at Queen Square, Nick Wood. The ne next gene after that was the gene DJ1, which was also found by an IPDGC member, Peter Herting, who was then in uh, Rotterdam, but is now in, uh, in Tübingen and that is also autosomal recessive. And then this gene FBOX07, I'll deal with at the same time, that's also a recessive gene, and that was found by Alahi, Alahi in Iran. The reason I've done those genes all together, they're all recessive, and they all have in common that they are involved in mitophagy. They are all involved in the process of removing damaged mitochondria from, uh, from cells. And I'll show that in a second. The next gene that was found was uh, uh, LERC2, and that was found by uh, both Andy Singleton's group at the NIH and Tom Grasser's group in, in uh, Tübingen. And that is an important gene not least because it's perhaps the most common cause of simple uh, uh, autosomal dominant disease. Uh, and that's been found in very high frequencies in European and Asian populations. There's a particular mutation in, in Europe, G2019S, uh, which is very, very common in actually Asia, in, in Europeans and people from North Africa. Uh, there are other mutations which are very common in the Chinese population. This is autosomal dominant and the onset age is in the 50s. Uh, it's interesting particularly because the pathology is usually Lewy bodies, not always about, uh, well, we have seven cases in the brain bank at Queen Square and six of them have Lewy bodies and the other does not. So the pathology is variable. The next gene, ATP13A2, 
was found in Jordan, and that is a, uh, in fact, is a lysosome, a lysosomal gene, and this was one of the first clue, clues of the relationship between lysosomal disease uh, and uh, and Parkinson's disease. Uh, and then PLAD2G6 was found by, as a gene for Parkinson's disease, was found by our group with Kailash Bhatia at Queen Square. We don't know exactly what that's involved, exactly what its function is, but we think it is also involved in lysosome in some way. And then there's VPS35, which is actually very similar, found by Matt Farah, very similar, in fact, to LERC2. A couple of other uh, genes involved in LERC2, with LERC2 and VPS35 have been found in the last couple of years, but they, and they have also similar features. So you can see that we have gone uh, in the last, uh, well, since 1996 from Sinuclean, we've gone through a really great period when we have found something like 15 autosomal dominant and autosomal recessive genes which cause Parkinson's disease. Now, you know, what we're trying to do, as I said at the beginning, is understand the pathways to disease. And I think the first stories which started to indicate that this was going to be possible were these papers here from Drosophila and this paper uh, from Mark Cookson for DJ1 in, uh, in, about, uh, in, in cell lines, uh, showing that these genes were all involved in mitophagy. And that is the process by which damaged mitochondria are now are removed from the cell. I, I should say that we geneticists sort of feel that we have discovered this. Uh, uh, you know, the, the genetics findings were in the late 1990s and early 2000s, but actually there's old papers uh, from, uh, for example, Tony Shapira amongst others, showing that there is, there has, for many years been a, uh, an implication of something being wrong in mitochondria in the, uh, in the substantia nigra in Parkinson's disease. So in fact, this idea that mitochondria might be involved in Parkinson's disease is not a new idea. This is a, a, a slide which uh, Helen Plum Favreau, who worked on FBOX07, uh, showed shows that, uh, that summarizes the essence uh, of what we think is going on in, in Parkinson's disease. Here we have a mitochondria. Here on the cell membrane is the gene pink, and that's constitutively being cleaved. It's being cleaved, but when you get mitochondrial damage, the amount of it increases on the cell membrane, and that recruits FBOX07 to the mitochondria, and that leads to Parkin, for Parkin to ubiquitinate uh, mitofusin and target that mitochondria for removal. Now, this happens in all cells. Why is it important, particularly in the Nigra? We think, well, we don't, the, the true answer to that is we don't know, but we suspect it's because maybe dopamine metabolism is particularly destructive. Uh, it produces a lot of uh, free radicals and, and it seems to be particularly perhaps destructive. So you get more mitochondrial damage in, in, nigral, in nigral cells than other cells. And it's interesting, and um, one thing I did not emphasize is the genes which are involved in mitophagy have a, a, diff a, a subtly diff well, a different clinical course to the others, and that is they remain rather nigral. In other words, people with these mutations, these recessive mutations, tend to have a very pure Parkinson phenotype, but they don't, uh, they don't often go on to develop, for example, dementia. Their, 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 their phenotype, although the disease starts quite early, they, uh, they, um, they don't develop other, uh, other symptoms. Now, 
I think a, a finding that really deserves some emphasis is the finding of glucocerebrosidase mutations in Parkinson's disease. And this originally came from clinical observations by Ellen Sidransky and others. Glucocerebrosidase mutations, as you know, uh, when homozygous, give rise to Gaucher's disease. And what these clinical researchers noticed was that often when they had kids with Gaucher's disease, the grandparents would often have Parkinson's disease. Uh, they'd have Parkinson's disease more often than you would expect by chance. Uh, and when that happened in a kindred, the affected grandparent always had the GBA mutation. And so this was the first clue that GBA heterozygosity um, predisposed to Parkinson's disease. I've mentioned ATP13A2, which is also a lysosomal gene uh, before. And so this is clearly a lysosome gene. And in fact, there's been a very nice paper from our colleague in the IPDGC, Josh Schulman, together with Peter Hertink. And they have shown that although we saw this, first of all, with GBA, we actually now think that mutations in many of the lysosome storage disease genes, which are usually, which are rarer than GBA mutations, or also predisposed to Parkinson's disease. So that gives the idea that um, uh, lysosome insufficiency, if you like, is a predisposing factor for Parkinson's disease. And that has led to this diagram being put together by my colleague, uh, Patrick Lewis, showing that um, putting this together and suggesting that many of the, the lysosome genes uh, are involved in the degradation of synuclein. And this is work that has been sh really shown in detail by the group from Northwestern University who've suggested that, there is, that synuclein is largely digested uh, through the lysosome and therefore fitting with the idea then that um, overproduction of, the, of synuclein is one cause of the disease, but failure to degrade it or insufficiency in degrading it uh, predisposes and is other causes of the disease. And that's led to this very simple diagram. I've drawn this as mitophagy versus autophagy, but of course they're both very closely related biochemical pathways. Both of them uh, are involved in the, uh, in the lysosomal degradation of uh, either synuclein on the left or mitochondria on the right. And so as a general principle, maybe low level uh, lysosome insufficiency is part of the risk of developing the disease. Now that fit, that's where I'll stop really talking about the autosomal dominant and Mendelian forms of the disease. I'll now move to talk about understanding the disease more generally. The autosomal dominant and autosomal recessive diseases really explain quite a small proportion. It's different in different populations, but I would say in the English population, maybe somewhere between five and 10% of cases have got either a GBA mutation or one of these Mendelian causes of the disease. So that leaves a lot of cases of the disease with much of their genetic risk still to find. And with that background, firstly, Andy Singleton and Tom Gasser, and then uh, myself, Hugh Morris, Nick Wood, Peter Hertink, uh, and Alexis Brees all joined in to form the uh, International Parkinson's Disease Consortium. And what this consortium did was collected very, very large numbers of cases. As I'll show you now, it's in the tens of thousands of cases of Parkinson's disease and, and uh, ran genetic markers across the genome to see which genes were co-associated with disease. This is one of the early studies 
I think at this stage we had about 3,000 cases and 3,000 controls. And, and what you can see here is the chromosomes along the bottom here and the significance value here. Because we're doing, we're running 500,000 markers, and that means we have to um, test, uh, we have to really do a massive Bonferroni correction because we're doing so many statistical tests. So we set the p-value at 10 to the minus 7 here, and what comes over the p-value is what we're allowed to declare. And the point I'll make from this is the first, the first three loci uh, which came out were synuclein again. Synuclein, of course, I've talked about already. A large locus close to the tau gene and then the HLA locus on chromosome six. So you can see then that this is starting to show um, uh, significant associations with these numbers of about 2000 cases. Incidentally, this peak here is LERC2. So LERC2 also comes out of this analysis. Now I'm gonna talk about synuclein for a second. I've mentioned that already that synuclein uh, triplications cause disease and so what you have here is uh, uh, the expression of synuclein here whoops sorry synuclein expression here and the risk of developing disease here what I've talked about so far is the synuclein triplication here you're massively expressing the protein and you have an well, you get the disease, it's autosomal dominant. There are families uh, which have duplications and they get the disease too, their risk is high too, but they get it a bit uh, later, a bit, a, a bit, yes, a bit later. And now what I've shown you is that ordinary genetic variability in synuclein affects expression of disease. And what we now know is that ordinary variability alters the expression of disease of synuclein and those of us who have higher expression have a marginally increased risk of disease and so there is a, a continuum if you like of understanding the um, the uh, the mendelian forms of the disease and understanding the risk forms of the disease and I mentioned that this was synuclein, and probably something similar is happening with synuclein. Ordinary genetic variability is contributing to the risk of disease by altering the expression. Now, the, the GWAS I showed you is a GWAS from about seven years ago. Now, this is the latest GWAS. Mike Knowles is the lead author. Uh, on this and it's on Lancet Neurology and you can see the peaks that were there before are still there uh, uh, but the p-values are now enormous way through the ceiling here. Synuclein is still the highest p-value. The tau locus is still here. I'm trying to see it but it is still here. Yeah it's here and LERC2 is now easily significant but what you can see is there are huge numbers. It's over 40, 50 now. There are huge numbers of other genes which are involved in disease. Now, because I'm gonna come back to this point at the end, I'm just gonna say something about these peaks. We know this peak is synuclein or something relating to synuclein. We know this peak is LERC2 or related to LERC2. And we label these others with gene names, but I have to say in many cases, we, don't, we can't be absolutely precise about uh, the gene. Because what happens when you get these peaks is that if you could expand these peaks, you'd see that there were several genes involved uh, the, underneath the peak. And it's very difficult in Caucasians to identify which of those genes underneath the peak is involved in disease. 
And so what we do when we draw a diagram like this is we give our best guess, but that best guess might not be accurate. And I'm sure that some at least of these genes will be, the peak is correct, but the labeling of the gene is probably incorrect because the, what's called the linkage disequilibrium pattern in Europeans is much coarser than it is in Africans. I read that the, the whole population of Europe is probably derived mainly from around 10,000 individuals. So the story which we used to be told, I don't know if it's still believed to be true, is there's more genetic variability in one African village <coughs> than there is in all of Europe. And that means the genetic resolution in you, when you uh, work in African populations is much better than the genetic resolution in European populations. This though shows, I think, what we can achieve. This, this is uh, again put together by Mike Norris, Mike Norris and, Corn and Cornelis Blauendrat showing how we have made progress in the number of genes we have found in Caucasians. Now well over 40 genes uh, have been found. So how can we, how, so I'm now going to deal with two things. How, how can we get better at identifying genes under peaks? And the answer to that is by studying the same process in African populations in particular. And of course, can we find other genes and other alleles and other risk factors in African populations so we can design treatments for those African populations based upon the genetic findings? To just illustrate this, we're now starting, uh, I say we in a general sense, starting to do treatments based on synuclein, experimental treatments. Obviously, uh, when you start to understand the genes involved in disease, you can start to devise perhaps strategies based upon those, based upon those genes. This shows you the, um, this shows you the, uh, the, the, the fact that the African populations are much more, much more interesting and fine-grained uh, than European population. I like this map on the right. This shows how far are you from East Africa and how long is a haplotype. And the haplotype um, in, um, in, in, in Europe well, this is actually, this is among American Indians. This is Europe here. The haplotypes in Europe are typically about 500 kilobases, whereas the haplotypes in Africa are of the order of 150 kilobases. So we get a three times better resolution. And that's shown here in a different way of plotting it. You get three times better resolution. So that means you can uh, for each peak, you can dissect that peak on average about three times better in African population. So what can we do? What can we do about this? Well, the, what we need to do for both African populations and for the rest of the world is to, we need to find the underlying causes of genetic diseases, including, of course, Parkinson's disease, we need to find those genetic causes in African populations. We need to find the Mendelian causes in African populations. We need to find the autosomal dominant and autosomal recessive populations. And um, actually, before I go further, I would say there's been a series of beautiful papers from North Africa identifying, uh, for example, Parkin and Pink One uh, families. So in, in North African populations, this work has started for many years, but we need to find uh, these uh, types of mutations in sub-Saharan Africans. And we also need to find do GWAS in African populations to get better resolution. So this is to show you that uh, in particular, this is a particular 
uh, study of uh, 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 a haplotype in, uh, in uh, a Nigerian population in, uh, an Af in uh, here in the top, and here is a European population. And in this example, the a disease gene was, a disease locus was here, but the result in the GWAS was a series of hits like this, which didn't allow distinguish, distinguishing identification. But in African populations, you saw a clean hit only in the correct spot. And this has been used very successfully by another colleague of mine here at, at uh, UCL called Nick Magnatis to find new genes for type 2 diabetes in African population using cross-modeling, if you like, from hits we've known about in Caucasians and looking at those hits in a Nigerian population. So this is really a process which for other diseases has been successfully approached. Just want to say one thing which I think has always been of interest to me, and that is when I was at Mayo Clinic, we had a, an, a, a, a family uh, come to us from Jamaica, an African family come to us Jamaica, from Jamaica, and they had all been diagnosed as Parkinson's disease. And in fact, they all responded to L-DOPA. They got the disease in their late 40s, and they uh, were very dopam dopamine responsive, lasted for about 20 years on L-DOPA therapy. And uh, so we started to look for the gene in these families, in this, in this large uh, Jamaican family. And to our surprise, we found that the gene was actually SCAR3. And this, of course, is the gene for ataxia and not, uh, not the gene for Parkinson's disease, not a gene thought of as a gene for Parkinson's disease. And when we tried to write this uh, paper up, people just said it was because our clinicians were not very good at doing differential diagnoses and that they must be wrong, they must be ataxic. But in fact, we then uh, approached Subramanian Subramoni in Alabama, who has a, a large clinic in, of African Americans. And uh, we looked in, uh, he's a genetics, uh, clinical geneticist and neurologist in Alabama. And he collected, uh, in, sorry, in Mississippi, he had collected uh, several families, for familial cases of Parkinsonism in his clinic. And what we found is that many of those also ha had been diagnosed as Parkinson's disease, but actually had SCAR3 mutations. And what this is telling us is that different genes can have different phenotypes in different populations. I don't think that's very surprising but I think it's very important for neurology in general, and I'm sure that it'll be the other way around too, that there will be um, cases which have mutations in one of the known Parkinson's disease gene, but will not be park, have Parkinson's disease as far as a clinical exam is concerned. And so I think it's going to be very important to get good clinical records of all the cases that are collected in Africa, so we can start to understand better in, in, in patient groups outside of Europeans, what the clinical phenotype of different mutations is. So I think this is something that is very clinically exciting as well. So what do I see as the future directions? And I'm so pleased that the IPDGC Africa has set up. Well, we need to find families and find the genes which cause them. We need to find that for them, uh, so that down the line, they or the next generation in those families can get the state-of-the-art therapies based upon the genetic findings. We'll find a lot, of the, a lot of the families we find will have genes we already know um, um, but we might find that they lead to different clinical phenotypes 
and we might find that also that there are other genes uh, which lead to Parkinson's disease, which we expected to cause, for example, ataxia. The complex disease by GWAS, we need to see if there are African specific loci. Are we going to find new genes? And are they uh, African specific? My expectation is that they won't be African specific, uh, but they, I, my expectation also is that we will find different variants in Africa and more variants in Africa than we have found in, Euro in, in Europeans. And I think that this will eventually help us better diagnose the disease earlier in African populations. We're just now, a colleague uh, of mine, Alistair Noyce, is just beginning to use genetic information to try and make pre-symptomatic diagnosis of Parkinson's disease in European populations uh, so that they can be entered into clinical trials earlier. And of course, we hope that Down Levine will be able to do the same sorts of things in other populations as well. And, you know, already a, a large number of especially Nigerian samples have been collected uh, by our collaborators there. So we've really already set off on this road and I'm very excited about it. So we'll almost certainly, as we go down to this road together, we'll almost certainly find new variants. We might find completely new genes. I think we would expect these to be in the mitophagy and autophagy pathways. And I really hope that this will down the line help us to get better at diagnosing diseases earlier and recognizing the variability of the disease. Thank you very much.